Well, once again, good evening uh, to all of you, and thank you so much for coming out for this, the third in our five-part series on uh, the problem of climate change. Uh, I see some familiar faces here and some new faces. Uh, we're very pleased that you uh, have found the series thus far uh, very interesting, and are going to try us once again. Uh, tonight, of course, we have a very uh, interesting uh, topic ahead of us. Uh, it's going to cover a very huge uh, part of the spectrum of issues in global change, uh, with a large part of the focus on the oceans and ice caps and uh, ocean acidification and much, much else. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, hour or so today, earlier in the day, uh, with our speaker, and uh, I can assure you it's going to be a very interesting uh, evening. Now, we have two more lectures coming up, one on the 18th uh, on Sunday, uh, and that will be, uh, the speaker will be Dr. Brahma Chalani, uh, who is one of India's foremost uh, strategic thinkers. He's with certainly one of the leading think tanks in New Delhi, the Center for Policy Research. Uh, he's published a book recently on climate change, and last year, Georgetown University Press published his book, uh, with the title, uh, uh, Water, Asia's a New Battleground, with an extremely provocative thesis, uh, which is that uh, if China continues with what uh, Dr. Chalani believes is a very aggressive uh, policy, including the diversion of massive amounts of the Brahmaputra River northwards to relieve the uh, parched northern plains of China, uh, that this would lead to uh, a, a potential for violence. In fact, he's called it a, it would be a declaration of war by China uh, against the two lower riparians, Bangladesh and India. An extremely provocative thesis. Not everybody uh, is going to buy into that, but I can assure you the book uh, is uh, absolutely extraordinarily well documented. And he certainly mounts a very persuasive argument, and it will certainly be an interesting evening that we'll spend with him. And then uh, following that, uh, Dr. Nathan Holtzman from the University of Maryland will be here uh, to make clear to us uh, some of the uh, remedies that have been proposed in carbon taxing, uh, sequestration, uh, and, and many other things. If you think that sequestration is something that's done to young uh, stallions, well, you'll find out differently uh, if you'll attend that lecture. He's uh, certainly one of America's leading authorities on uh, uh, mitigation, uh, uh, ways of, to mitigate the problems of climate change. Anyway, uh, we're hoping that at the end of the five that uh, at least some of us here in Qatar will have a better understanding of the very, very complex issues that are to be found under the heading of uh, climate change. At this point, I'd like to uh, call upon Malik Abayeb uh, to introduce our speaker. Malik. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Georgetown University. Dr. Robert Carell is the principal of the Global Environment and Technology Foundation and its Center for Energy and Climate Solutions. He also holds the Arctic Chair at the University of Tromsø, Norway, and is a professor at the University of the Arctic's Elat Institute for Circumpolar Reindeer Husbandry at Kaito Kino, Norway. Dr. Carell is a senior fellow in the Atmospheric Policy Program of the American Meteorological Society. Prior to these appointments, he was Assistant Director for Geosciences at the National Science Foundation, where for over 12 years he had an oversight for the atmospheric, earth, and ocean sciences at the global change programs of the NSF. While at the NSF, Dr. Carell served as the chair of the National Science and Technology Council's committee that has oversight of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. He has served as chair and principal U.S. delegate to many international bodies with interests in and responsibilities for climate and global change research programs. Dr. Carell currently serves as the chair of the steering committee for the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, which is an international assessment of the impact of climate variability, change, and ultraviolet radiation increases in the Arctic region. 
Dr. Carell is an oceanographer and engineer by background and training, having received his PhD, MS, and BS degrees at the Case Institute of Technology and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and having held appointments at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and the University of Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carell. What I want to do with you tonight is, is sort of a, a, a look at the larger scale issues that underpin some of this, but focus on a few that, in my judgment, and I think others as well, are going to be some of the keystone issues that come out of climate change that will have a profound effect on people around the world. So what we want to do is ask what's happening, uh, what are the climate negotiators going to have to contend with in terms of background scientific issues as they meet here in the weeks ahead. So uh, climate change and global warming. And I have to do this. How did we get here? How is it possible that we find ourselves in this situation where somehow the Earth is changing in ways remarkable? As all of you know from your geology courses and studies, we have, we have named various times of the planet. The Carboniferous world is one where we create, where the planet created most of the fossil fuels. We now have renamed the era we live the Anthropocene. Anthropo, meaning human, now has the capacity to steer the future of the planet in ways that humankind has never had with our seven plus billion people and magnificent growth and development in ways that have a chance to influence the, the way the planet functions. So <clears throat> climate change uh, is, is pretty well set in a large context. And I want to take a minute and go back 500 million years ago. And, and you can see to the far left that, and that's temperature there. We're talking only a few, less than 10 degrees of variability in global temperature. You see 10 degrees of temperature change in a day but that's just what's happening in a day. We're talking about what's happened over long time scales, years, tens of years. And you can see that we were basically a very warm planet for a long, long time. And <clears throat> if I get this right, um, most of the fossil fuels were formed way back then. You know, roughly 300 million years ago, when the planet was warm, a lot of vegetation was coming on, life forms were beginning to develop, some that are even here yet today many of which are no longer with us, but certainly a lot of vegetation uh, occurring in that time frame. <coughs> um, so the Earth was heavily covered with plants, and it was this period around 300 million years ago that we started creating the fossil fuels that are the, the backbone of our energy world today, world worldwide. About seven million years ago, <coughs> the planet was about two degrees warmer, and we came out of that very warm period and entered into a very different kind of climate. And um, in that period seven million years ago, up until about 10,000 years ago, um, things were violently moving around. You can see on times, very short time scales, big swings, uh, one, two, three, four degrees. We then entered what's called the, the climatic optimum. So for 10,000 years, we've had less than 7 tenths of a degree variability in our climate. And as a consequence of that, <coughs> we're moving into a period where we had all these ice ages and we're coming up to a new period which is very different. And I want to look at that a little more carefully. We had um, about 300 parts per million. And if you're looking for the kind of the GDP measure for climate, it's called parts per million or PPM. So if you know something about the PPM of climate, that's parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere or parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It gives you a measure of where we are on this scale. And you can see that most of the time we were about 270 until we entered uh, <coughs> the uh, period we now live in which is uh, characterized by an, the Industrial Revolution. So we're almost up to 400 now. So we've come almost 100 parts per million in 200 years. We've added that into the atmosphere in ways that will have profound effect and we'll talk about. <laughs> but here's that laid out for you. 10,000 years over on the right, we came in. That's a variability period. But two very exciting things happened. 
First was a little warming, only at seven tenths of a degree, but it created the Mesopotamian period with a flourishing of humankind, inventing agriculture, inventing all the things that humans have now as everyday life, moving from you know, little tiny uh, cultures of maybe 10 or 15 people to cities or villages and warping together and building new kinds of relationships and the idea of towns starting to occur. We had cooled off just a bit and then we entered the medieval warming period where again, uh, in this case, the Vikings and others began to see that there was something across the Atlantic that was attractive only to be driven back by a little ice age that occurred in uh, the middle of the last millennia. And now we're coming forth. This is a, uh, a IR thing, and I have to be careful. I have to point it at it. So we got that very little variance in there. And so I call this whole 10,000-year period humanity's sweet spot. It gave us, as humans, as we know today, 12,000 years ago, Cro-Magnum were in southern Europe. So they were coming out of a very primitive development of humankind into this new era where it allows us to be in a building so beautiful as the one in which we're seated tonight. <clears throat> and so I call that humanity's sweet spot, but something very different is happening. Because as, as we have grown in population, which you'll see in a minute, we have been doing things to change the planet in some ways irreversibly. So let's go beyond. So where, where does all that CO2 come from and where does it go? Most of the CO2 comes from fossil fuel burning, from coal, oil, and natural gas. About 10% of it comes from clearing the tropical forests. This slide, less than five years ago, was 8515, because we've been making progress on reducing the, the number of tropical forests we're taking off, but also, unfortunately, the upper part is growing in proportion to the lower, but where, where does it go? Those are the sources. It goes to three places. Roughly half of it goes into the atmosphere. And about a quarter of it goes into the forests and the plants that create the oxygen that transforms through photosynthesis the very life on the planet. And another quarter goes into the ocean. And we'll come back to that, because that going into the ocean is turning out not to be a very a positive thing as we grow. But that's kind of the story we have there. But there is a problem, and the problem is this. That, uh, it, we lost the little piece. The two places it goes to are becoming saturated. The ocean is, is taking it up as fast as it can, and the land is taking it up as fast as it can. But there's a 5% reduction in those two. So that extra 5% is going into the atmosphere, which accelerates this greenhouse effect that we're going to spend our evening with. Now let's look at just oh, a, a little history. We, remember, we have increased the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, almost half in this Industrial Revolution. And we started in the 70s putting one part per million, all of us, per year. Then it went to this point, 1.6, then it went down a little, then it went back up a little, went way up, and it came down a little for one reason. The, the uh, financial problems of the world sh shut some of our productivity down, but <clears throat> it went back up in 2012. Now, just multiply that by 10. So roughly now, we're, we, in 10 years, we can put 25 more of these PPMs in the atmosphere. In 40 years, we can add another 100. That stuff is going fast, to say the least. So what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> Obviously, it's accelerating. How did we get there? Well, I'm going to show you a little movie. It only takes a few minutes. But it comes fast enough that I want to have you look at a few things. It's going to be a picture of the, of the planet and all the, the continents. And over here, you'll have the year in which the image is taken. And over there, you will have the emissions we're putting in the atmosphere in, in millions of metric tons. Now, that's a big number. But we're only put, we only put 2 million into the atmosphere in 1750. And it was less and less over that 10,000-year that period. 
as our population has grown and becomes more eager to get it. So, <clears throat> so we have this coal, and oil, and, and natural gas. And, and watch what happens. I think it should run. Here we go. Industrial revolutions being born in England. Coal became the dominant factor in industrializing the most first industrial nation in the world. Around 1800 or there, it starts to leak into Europe. France and Germany start to pick it up. And by about the mid-1800s, the influence of the Brits on taking technology across the Atlantic starts to light up the United States. And now we're in 1900, not too long ago, all that. The world in that mid-band uh, is starting to light up. And the amount of emissions are color-coded. And, and we don't need to go into it. It's obvious <coughs> when you get uh, yellows and reds. So by now, look what happened that too. We're now in 2004 at 7,000. And look what's happened. Industrialization has occurred where you would expect from having read the newspaper and listened to TV and the radio. Uh, South Africa has come very rapidly. <coughs> Europe uh, has come very rapidly. And parts of the Middle East, the United States, particularly the eastern part, China's come on board, Japan's come on board a bit of southern part of Australia, and then it's speckled thereafter, very little in the high parts of, of and now if we go and just look a little bit of history. So we started around two, and there's where the carbon emissions, and I've now plotted them for you all the way up to 2012, and population was only 750 million people on the planet. And now we go to today. Population seven plus billion. Remember this eight seventeen fifty to now. There's a massive change in population. And our emissions are starting to grow exponentially. And one of the things I'd like to leave you with is the transformation that occurred on this planet can be targeted around 1950. With few exceptions, I guess maybe some exceptions, many of us were around 1950. I was still in high school in 1950. And so I think with Bob and a few others of us, the rest of you, 1950 is history. Uh, but around 1950, the knee of the acceleration curve on virtually everything I'm going to show you took off, whether it be finances, the use of energy, population growth, all of them are accelerating. This is the post-World War II explosion in human development on the planet. Not uniform by a long shot. And many have remained in deep poverty and, 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 and disease in ways that are not very attractive. But look what, look what happened to the emissions. We're now pushing 10,000. We started at 2 and 3. So we've had a, about 3,500 times growth in the emission in that short period of time. So this is how we're getting there. It's, in a way, a product of that sweet spot of humanity being able to do what it has done forever in those 10,000 years, invent ways to make life better. Technology, better food, and the like. So we'll pop that off. And here's just a summary of that. And you can see in a way, a cascadal growth in our population by putting it this way. The target that most people talk about is about 9 billion. And the reason for that is, 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 is twofold. With the education of women around the planet, uh, fertility rates will go down. But we're also getting over the expansion of, of life. We've got a massive expansion in length of life. And that's part of it. So, uh, men and women are not dying off as fast as, as, they, uh, uh, as they have in the past. So I suspect somewhere between that six and eight or nine, 10 billion is probably where we're headed. But who knows? That's probably one of the most difficult things to project. But here's the thing that's b extraordinary. I, I, I did this. 
because I was interested in the relationship between emissions and population, because it seemed like it was there. And it didn't, it didn't occur to me it would be linear. So I went to a whole different data set. I went to three different data sets of population and emissions, and they get the same answer. So <clears throat> if someone in a cocktail party says, you know what the emissions were when we were 7 billion people, uh, 6 billion, just tell them multiply by 11 and 1,100, and you get it. We don't know what's happening out here. Some of my friends say, Bob, you ought to put a, a second order curve on there because it looks like it's accelerating, and it may be, but it would be too early, in my view, to say so. So this is kind of how we get it, how we got into the climate issue. And here's what the projections are over the decades ahead. Most of the world's de population development will be in the developing world. And as a matter of fact, from 1950 on, it's been there. The developed world has not grown dramatically. But remember, <coughs> this is absolute numbers. So it has been very modest increase in total number of, of individuals living in the so-called developed world. All right, now we're going to take another little journey. This is a not doctored up picture of planet Earth taken from Saturn, 800 million miles from the camera. <coughs> the camera is at Saturn, and that's us. And it's blue, blue because it's water. It's the blue planet. And I put this up here because this is our home. This is the only home we know. It's the home we are going to have to take care of. And I hope during our discussion tonight, the real issue of the negatives will be overtaken by our optimism that we as humans have the capacity to steward the future of our planet. And that's why. So what does all this mean in, for planet and humanity? So you get pictures like this. I'm sure you've seen it. This is the so-called Keeling curve. Uh, when it was first brought out, people said, well, I guess it's going to grow. The oscillations here are nothing more than the seasons. So, you know, in the, in the wintertime in the north, this, these data are taken in Hawaii. So you'll get uh, rapid growth in the summer and the fall off. But the general trend, it's interesting. You can note things if you want to find things like Pinatubo and all the others. So some of those dips in the curve, some of the economic dips are the reason for wiggling. And I could spend time and I won't bother you with that. But we're up at this 394 ppm as of today. I dug the numbers out for you. Now here's the, if you take all this information and say, what does it mean in terms of the temperature? So this is actual hard data that, that takes us, why did the scale go off? I don't know why. It takes us from uh, 1880 to 2003. So the global mean surface temperature has increased by Eight tenths of a degree. Remember, I said that band of comfort that has been ours was seven tenths. I won't argue that we're out of it, but it looks like we're moving out of it. And I can tell you by the end of the evening that we're really moving out of it. But so we've, we've started to take ourselves out of that comfort zone. But if you live in the Arctic, the temperature differences there are two to three times the global average. So as, as uh, was introduced, I do work with people in the high north. I can hold a professorial position up there, too, in fact, and work with reindeer herders. And I'll tell you, it's happening. We know it. We've known it since about 1950 and 60. They'll give you those numbers. And remember, these are oral cultures. These are people who, who don't use the same sort of written language that we do to describe our, our understanding, but they have fabulous understanding of how the planets function, because that was their livelihood. People ask, um, in our terms, because we're going to do a lot of projecting, um, do the models really work? Now, the nice thing about a model is you can yank it back to 1900 and ask questions about what if we humans didn't put that stuff in. So in fact, <coughs> I hope this works for me. So here are the two things we did. By the way, this has been run on about. 40 different models and get the same answer. If we humans didn't put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we also didn't put sulfur, which is a cooler in the atmosphere, but all the natural forces were there, radiation from the sun and pinatubos and all the others from volcanoes, we would have been in the blue zone. In fact, we would have been headed towards another ice age. It's arguable that we'll ever go to another ice age. 
humans have made such a difference that we may have janked us up to the point where the forces that create an ice age are smaller than the forces we have. Then you put the humans in and you get, and then you can put the observations on it. So I would argue that certainly on the time scale of a few decades ahead, the models are going to do very well out to, I would say, 2050. When you get out to 2100, the band of uncertainty will go up, but the band of uncertainty will not be very large at 20 uh, in the next 40 years or so. So well, let's see what happens here. Now, um, Bob introduced by saying we're going to talk about the oceans. <clears throat> and uh, I'll tell you another little story. I was, as, he, as he said, I was at, at the NSF. But before I was in the NSF, I spent my life in the academic world, at the various places that were mentioned including the University of New Hampshire. A phone call came from a colleague of mine at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, a sort of god in our business, Walter Monk. And Walter, in 1975, said to me, Bob, something weird's going on in this ocean. We got temperature changes in what we call a SOFAR channel, which is deep, deep in the ocean, that are way beyond any band we've ever seen. Something's going on here. This is 1975. And as a consequence of that observation and the, what has happened thereafter, we can see the oceans are really what I call the thermodynamic driver of the planet. And by thermodynamic, I mean heat and its dynamic behavior. So let's see a little bit about that. So what role do the oceans play? <clears throat> they contain the, most of the water. Almost all the evaporative processes occur in the ocean, and those evaporative processes are part of our weather, our climate system. So, you know, it's the dominant play. Even though the ocean is 70 percent of the planet, these uh, these overrule that 70 percent, and it's uh, a little more than 70 percent of the precipitation of rain and snow go out of the. And the oceans control the timing and the magnitude of the changes in the global climate system. They are. They are the governing force that governs the future of how the planet will behave, because that's where the energy goes, and we'll talk more about that. So <clears throat> because the oceans absorb 90%, look at this. This data was 2001. That energy that comes from the sun, 90% of it goes in the ocean. And we're overheating the planet because of this climate change issue. All the stuff we talk about is less than 10 percent, melting glaciers and warming the atmosphere, reducing sea ice and the like. So this gives you some idea. That's where the, that's where the money is, if you will. You know, that's where the energy is. It's, it's sitting in the ocean. And uh, one of the sad moments that I won't talk about very much is if we stopped all emissions today, went to zero, the planet would warm one more degree for this reason. The heat's in the ocean, it'll come back out, and it'll warm the planet. So it's really a powerful force. So is it, is it really absorbed very much? I'm going to do this pretty rapidly. We do the same experiments here <clears throat> and ask ourselves, if we humans didn't put all this stuff in the atmosphere, what would the ocean temperatures be? And they'd be, and by the way, this is only down to 700 meters. The ocean depth averages are around 30, uh, 12,000, uh, uh, 12, 12 kilometers. Got to get the numbers right. If we run the problem again and say, we humans have been putting all this stuff, what would the distribution of temperatures be? That's the green. And then the dots are, are the numbers. So I think you can argue that while our science isn't perfect, it's a lot of unanswered questions. It's getting the essence right. The trends are there. The numbers match up. And one of the things about scientists is we always challenge each other. It's a debating society all the time. I don't like your numbers. I'm going to do my own. And unless everybody can repeat this, this was done by Barnett and his team. Several others have come to the exact same conclusion. So let's look at this ocean. <coughs> I think by now you've heard about this wonderful thing we call um, the conveyor belt. But something very unique happens up here in the high uh, North Atlantic. This conveyor belt is running on the surface. As you can see, it comes through Indonesia. It comes into very warm water, comes up, becomes a part of the Gulf Stream, 
and it moves that heat northward, which is why Europe for the same latitude is much warmer than say in the North, of Atlant uh, in the North American continent because that heat's going up there. I go to a, where, way at the top of Norway under the T in critical, that's where one of the universities I work with, ice-free harbors. They don't, they don't have any ice, they've never had any ice. The Gulf Stream just does a lovely job. They call themselves the Paris of the North. So let's see what that looks like. This is a more complicated picture. Here's that current coming up and it's swinging all around and it's like spaghetti and it's cooling, releasing energy into Norway and Europe. And then it's starting to get cold. And as it gets colder and colder, and when it becomes blue, a very unique moment in its history occurs. It's at four degrees C. It's very rich in, sal in, in salinity. It's heavy. And it just literally drops to the bottom of the ocean. And it pulls that whole thing all the way from the North Pacific behind it. And it's the engine as it pulls all that water down to the bottom. And it returns, if I go back, it returns on the bottom as salty deep water coming up in the North Pacific, creating one of the richest fisheries in the world because it's accumulating all those nutrients that supply the necessary feedstock for a fishery. So let's go on. We're, something's happening. Bob's right, ocean's really important to us. These are measurements. There's melting going on. Melting is all fresh water. So you'll see between um, the 70s, late, around 1970 to uh, 30 years later, guess what? The water up there is getting less salty. So the big question in the science community today is, if that's happening, is that conveyor belt going to continue to function because we know in the past it has stopped. Now remember, all that energy is there. We're not moving. We're not going to get rid of it. But what we're going to do is change where it goes. This is the best model. So it's not going to go all the way up, heat Norway and Sweden. and those. It's likely to swing across. And uh, guess what? Europe's going to get warmer by a lot. Now, this may not be the right model, but it's one of several. But what's clear to us is if we keep melting this and putting fresher and fresh water into that, we're going to create less of that pull force that creates this movement. And whether it shuts down, I would say no. I think it'll get redistributed. And this is one of the models. So nothing, <coughs> there's strong cooling now uh, in the North Atlantic, warming elsewhere. But there's no net change in the energy because it's still there. It just goes to new places. So let's go to look at some other things. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a biggie. The increase in carbon dioxide over the atmosphere in just the last 100 years have increased the acidity level in the ocean by 30%. So the, the ocean is more acid. <coughs> And the reason it's more acid, that CO2 goes into the water and becomes carbonic acid, the same way your Coke bottle has carbonic acid that gives you, gives you, a, you know, a, a, an extra enjoyable part of your carbonated drink. Um, so what's that going to do? Well, it signifies that we're going to really change the character of the food chain. And let's see if I can convince you of that. Now, these are actual data. We've not seen in the fossil record in the ocean bottom anything like this in 65 million years. And that's when the dinosaurs came and kind of took us out of business. So that's probably a, a, a reasonable mark. But if you look above and you look what's happening to acidification, when the, when the thing goes down, that's more acid. You would think we'd, we'd be smart enough to make it go up for public, but we don't. So it's more acid in the Canaries, Hawaii, and Bermuda. And look what's happening to the structure of the bottom of the food chain called phytoplankton. These are the tiny little, almost single cell animals, uh, plants. And their exoskeletal structure that holds them together is made out of calcium. Acid loves calcium. So here's the bottom of the food chain that's going to be affected. But the, it's going to be affected all the way up the food chain. Those are herring. 
It's going to be beautiful tropical fishes that are affected. Food stocks that happens to be rockfish. Porpoise. Whales. Beautiful animals. The point I'm trying to make is that this acidification at the bottom is the food stock as they, as they eat their way up the food chain. You know, so someone eats the plants, the zooplankters, the, the animal, little tiny animals, fish, so on up the food chain. And it doesn't take very long to figure out we're in trouble. And, and let me show you how much in trouble we are. This is a revisit of that. I'll give you some of these calcareous uh, planktonites that uh, form the bottom of the food chain. But here's the story. 25 million years, it's oscillated around pretty flat. We're already low, as low or lower than it was 25 million years ago. But by 2100, that's where the ocean is going to be acidification-wise. And we're going to really, really affect the bottom of the food chain that rises all the way up in the ocean. And you know, I should go back here. Whoops, did the wrong thing. If you add up the weight of these phytoplankton on the planet, they weigh more than all the rest of, of animal and plant life on the planet. <laughs> there are a lot of them. So we really don't want to screw around with them. OK, so acidification is a problem. And, it's, and, uh, and by the way, I'm trying not to give you personal opinion. Every, all these slides and all this data comes from peer-reviewed literature so that you, know, you can say that's confident stuff. It's got, it's got the track record and the credibility. And <clears throat> this particular study has been done by many, and they all come to basically the same conclusion. They may argue it's not 7.8. It might 7.82 or 7.93 or something, but, uh, but not, not much different. So let's take the next jump. Um, so it looks like the ocean's got a problem with just the mere existence of CO2 over the atmosphere, no matter what the temperature is. Well, it matters a teeny bit by how much gets absorbed, but that's second order. Now we got something else that's uh, going to be a temperature effect. In this picture, we're looking down at the north. I think you can see uh, where I am. And we are now warming the permafrost. And the permafrost exists in two places. It exists on land, where buried in there are methane or methane generators, some biological material that, if it warms, will create methane. And in the ocean, we call them clathrates. And so from both places, there's warming taking place. And these regions are already close to thawing temperature. And I will try to demonstrate for you a couple of realities. This is about a month old data from the Russians. They were out in the Lena River is, is not quite far eastern Russia, but it's pretty close. Well, you can see how close it is. It's six time zones from, from Moscow, so it's really out there. And when they're in the Laptev Sea, they, they discovered extraordinary volumes of, of of methane in the water and in the atmosphere above it. And they covered a 10,000 square mile area. So when this came out, those of us who have been wor not as worried as others that maybe it's going to be longer, it looks like things are moving more rapidly. And let me share something with you. This is a colleague of mine who does this. She's from the University of Alaska, Katie Wallers. All she did was drill a hole in the ice in a little lake, and throw a match at it. And methane is natural gas. We technically call it methane, but the public calls it natural gas. So uh, these methane bogs in Siberia are already leaking. And uh, how soon is this to be a problem? I would argue that this has probably got to be one of the most important research projects we undertake, is to do a better job of, of projecting that. The most recent projections indicate that by 2100, methane will add another half a degree or one degree to the warming. But whether that number is solid, I don't know. I have colleagues who say that's too low. Others who say it's too, um, it, it, it's, it's too high. But we'll see. Watch it. It's coming. Uh, 
What does methane do? It goes into the atmosphere. It's 25 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So it accelerates the process. So we have these new accelerators we're putting into the, into the game. And again, scientists are bad. They call that positive feedback. Most of us say positive is a good thing. But positive feedback in a system is a bad thing. And we just have to invert our thinking about it. But a couple of, a couple of facts. Let's go back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a resident time in the atmosphere, mean resident time, that means 50% of it, stays in the atmosphere for 120 years. But we all just exhaled carbon dioxide, and 10% of that will be here 10,000 years from now. So we're, we're doing things in very short time scales, decades, hundreds of years, and we're going to create a legacy that has tails on it that are thousands of years. And when we get to sea level rise, you'll see the same story. So it's asymmetric. We can change things rapidly, but we cannot recover from them rapidly at all. OK. So here we're back in the high north. And what's happening here to the Arctic is important. It affects the whole planet, even though it's probably hard to see. So what? What's been going on since these great adventurers went up there, uh, had a fascinating time discovering things that no one on the planet had known before? And I want to take you on a little a journey. Now, here's the record since 1900 to just give you the fact that when the planet warms a little, the Arctic warms a lot. When the planet cools a little, the Arctic cools a little. And I mean, cools a lot. So you get some idea. And this is where this factor of two to three amplifier. So when people give you numbers, ask, are they mean values? That means on average. And then the next question you have to ask, is there a big spread? I have a colleague who, who studied this and gave us some of the probability ideas about this. And, uh, would you like to run your whole life with only a 50% probability? Probably not a good idea. In fact, Steve Snyder contracted a virulent form of cancer. And he told the docs, you're not treating me on a mean value. We're going to treat me two sigma out so that we're going to treat, going to cover me with 97% of the possibilities, not just 50. He survived the cancer. He lived another. 15 years cancer-free, and then unfortunately passed away with a heart attack that was born of all of the medication he had to take. But he taught us some things about thinking about the mean is not the way to think about things, because we would not like to invest uh, our future in a, a mean value. So now this is what the Arctic Ocean is beginning to look like. Um, and I want to go in more detail, but here's that story again. Here we're, we're back to. <coughs> the year 600, so 1,400 years in the past. That's what's happening to the extent of the sea ice. It wandles all over the place. But it doesn't change very much. In fact, the evidence of we're heading towards an ice age is there. You can see the slight slope over these 1,400 years. But look what's going on now. We're coming out of that like there's no tomorrow. And in fact, there's the picture of sea ice extents from 1979 to now. These numbers exceed anything we have ever projected. We projected that at the outside, it would be after 2100 that we would have an ice-free Arctic in, in, the, in the summer. I have colleagues who are saying it's going to occur in 2015. Others saying 2020. The consensus is it'll be ice-free in the summer by around 2030. That would, if you want a number to blame me on, that's the one you can blame me on. But I then say plus or minus 10, <laughs> something like that. But you can see the problem. Things are really rolling rapidly. Now I'm going to show you a little movie. This is the age of that ice. If it's white, it's real old, 9, 10, or maybe 20, 30 years old. And over here's the clock. We're now in the early 1990s. The whiteness is going out. And we're extruding all that old ice into the North Atlantic in the Norwegian Sea between Norway and Norway, or Fram Straits. Take you up. 
pretty close to the president. Watch what happens to that old stuff. It's almost all gone. I'll go a little further. Here's another picture of it. There's a 1988. That little red strip is the old stuff. All the rest isn't one or two years old. Old stuff is real hard, real thick, very tough to go through with an icebreaker. One-year-old ice is like a meter, and it's very soft and it's easy to break through. So we're changing the whole character of that basin for economic development. And we'll say a few words about that in a minute. But it's, it's because that, that ice is very young, it's very, very heavy, very thick, and it's not hard to get through. In fact, the Chinese took a standard container ship, strengthened it a little, and took it from from Shanghai, <clears throat> to get this straight, to Rotterdam. And they went around the, the Russian coast, because that seemed to be the open area, which you can look at if you want. But they went home through the, right through the middle, because they could break their way through a meter. And so it's changing how people in, in the transportation and trade industry are thinking about how that change is occurring. And that's another one. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Oh, the reason I showed you that, the winter ice looks the same way. It's not just summer ice. So here's this story I told you. All that blue and red, that was our projections. And the black is what's really happening. So opening the seaways is really going to open the whole story about natural resources. Who's going to get what? And where are they going to do it? Here's one of the consequences. Russia, Europe, currently, the Far East market, China particularly, but Japan and Korea, have to go through the, the Straits, go through the <coughs> Suez Canal to Europe. Um, that's the old path. The new path takes them through the Arctic and is 45% shorter. Attractive if you're in the transportation business. and. You don't through the Straits of Malacca, which is the most dangerous. When I showed this picture to a group from Korea, they said, opening is one thing, but getting out of the Straits of Malacca is the biggest deal, because that's where all the pirates are, where people lose ships and uh, things. So they don't want to do that. So there's a lot of interest in this, and we could talk it about. And here's the other thing that's of interest. The green spots, that's where all the oil and, and natural gas are in the Arctic, both on land and in the ocean heavily in Russia, surprisingly lots in Greenland, um, a little bit in Canada and, and the United States, not even enough to make it green. And the Norwegians have a major interest in this for reasons we can talk about if you want to raise questions. OK, now, so changes in the Arctic wind patterns are going to take us to the next thing that's happening in the Arctic. So we've got, we got this. Uh, <coughs> acidification issue, we've got this change in the circulation patterns, the changing temperature distributions, um, and so on. And now I want to get to the last of the ocean things before I take you on a sea level trip. OK. And these, are, these things are accelerating, but they're changing the weather patterns in the high Arctic. And if everything works for me, you're going to see a little movie. These are the wind patterns August of this year. You see that? Watch this piece of ice over here on the left. Watch it. In days, it changes. This, these are brand new wind patterns. We have measured wind patterns up there since 1979. And what's happened is this ocean opens up, huge amount of heat come out into the atmosphere because the ice over the ice, you've got temperatures 30, 40 degrees below zero. Here you have water that's warm. That is going to go and heat the atmosphere. And as a consequence, this thing, which in this case is a broken gyre, it sends cold water to Europe, a cold air to Europe and warm water to Greenland. And you've seen that in the literature. Europe has had some wicked cold. And the year it was cold, I called my colleagues in, in Greenland in the capital. They had not had a snow, only rain. And they said never in their history. 
does anybody know that at the Capitol they would not have snow on the ground in the wintertime? So we're going to see this around the planet. We saw it just two weeks ago. Sandy. Sandy was a hurricane, but Sandy was also two other big storms. And finally, the science community is starting to say, we got to tell the people that climate's underpinning these changes. We've all been kind of timid about it. We say, well, it's consistent with, and baloney, it is driven by a warmer ocean. Warmer ocean puts more energy into the atmosphere, and the cyclonic events like cyclones, two, uh, uh, hurricanes, and are all 50% more energetic today than they were 35 years ago. So we're going to see a lot more Sandys, and they're not going to be fun. OK. I want to take just a teeny bit, uh, a little bit. If we change the mean, and you've been hearing me say the means are changing, what's going to happen is we're going to have less cold stuff and a lot hotter stuff. So, but something else happens. And we change the variance. There's more variability in it. So this center part drops down, but we pick up some more cold. This is the stuff that happened in Europe. So it is this transformation of the statistical character of, in this case, temperature patterns that cause these things to hop up. So we're going to get more cold weather. We're going to get more hot weather, but we're going to get more extremely hot weather. And it's because of the character change in how, how this physics system and chemistry system works that changes the distribution of probable events on the planet. OK, now we're going to just have a fun trip. Uh, as, as some in this room knows, I have a colleague that we've worked together. She is here at the moment. Uh, and uh, we've worked together since 1989, right? Lynn Mortensen. Uh, <clears throat> and these are icebergs. The iceberg on the left, that peak I've measured, it's 100 meters off the water. That means there's 700 meters that baby underwater. And so this is a group I give. Some of my colleagues are on that other boat. So let's look at what's happening to Greenland. Here's what's happening to the melts in Greenland. This is kind of a classic picture, melting along the edges. A little more, you know, 15 years later. And if I put this in a larger context, you can see the pattern. It's slow. But it's still like a 50% or 100% increase in the area. But it's a relatively small area of Greenland. July 8th, that's what it looked like. Four days later, it went from 40%. I'll give you a better picture. It went from 40% melt to 97% melt. So all that melting is going to put water in the ocean, and it's the first thing that creates sea level rise, because that, that's what, what, what happens to the water, contributes to it. But there are some other things we'll talk more about as in a minute. This blew all of us out of the water when it came to understanding. We had no, no idea we would start melting it like that. I personally think it was that, <coughs> that combination of screwing up the gyre, creating a warmer Greenland, a colder Europe, which is probably going to, we're going to see that pattern. And we, I think we just saw it here this past summer. This is this last summer. The other thing about Greenland is it not only melting, but we're losing mass. In other words, there's less, there's less ice there. Uh, we could talk as to the why and wherefore, but this tells you it's, it's screaming down at a very rapid rate. OK. All right. Let's look at sea level. Now these are these are tide gauges for you know close to 200 years. Watered all over the place here. Um, <clears throat> my suspicion is some of that is probably data that is not as good all the time because it was a long time ago. But since about 1850 or 1900, it's pretty good. And these are two data sources, so you can see sea level is indeed rising. Um, and here's a projection. Um, we'll have about a half a meter, a little less, by mid-century. We'll have something of the order of <coughs> 1.2 or, or so meters by uh, the turn of the century. 
Put another way, well, we're going to put about a foot of water into every generation. Now, when I put this slide together about four months ago, that was the story. Within the last four months, I have a series of very significant studies that suggest this is very, very uh, less than optimistic. Jim Hansen says five meters by 2100. Several are saying two for sure. Another paper says Greenland alone will give us a meter in those time periods. So we're, we're looking at some pretty significant amount of melting of these areas contributing to sea level rise. And just to tell you quickly, sea level comes from first just warming the water, because as it warms, it expands. About 2 thirds of all the sea level rise today is just warming the ocean water. The second comes from land-based glaciers and ice mass such as Greenland. Greenland's the big boy in this game. Antarctica will be about 30 years behind us and is starting to catch up already, contributing to this. So I would say, if you want a good number, somewhere between one and two meters by the end of the, of the, of the century. And here's what that's going to do. Tomorrow morning, uh, former Vice President Gore does something every so often. He calls it a 24-hour reality show. At 8 PM in every time zone, we do a story on climate change. And I'm doing the story on sea level rise at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, because that's 8 o'clock in the small islands in the Pacific, and we're going to talk about all this. Out here in the Western Pacific, for a variety of reasons, but the two dominant reasons are there's more heat being distributed there, just because of the character of where it is on the planet, but also the ocean circulation patterns. So the fact of life is <coughs> we're going to get an amplifier of 3 to 5 of sea level. So you got these small island states. And if the planet has seen between, say, 20 and 30 centimeters of sea level rise, they've seen a meter. And if you go down there, that's what they'll tell you. They've already seen a meter. And under the circumstances we're talking about, these small island states will be history. Up off the north of, of Alaska, Shishmarif, and Kivalina and several other small islands communities are packing up to leave. They've been there from at least 400 years, more likely 1,000 years. And they're having to leave their homes. I've been up there, and I've met with them. The young people are saying, Mom, Grandpa, we're leaving. So now they have a third poll. And I throw this in here because people can always talk about the third poll. And I would just one slide for you on it. Uh, it is the place where there's a lot of ice, namely the Himalayas, because there are 46,000 glaciers there, and they provide <coughs> meltwater for a lot of people on the planet. And there's a wide variation, but the real issue for them is not climate change so much as the change in the monsoon that may, in fact, be climate driven. A lot of increased soils melt from climate change, but mostly it's the change in population and the way people have settled and so on that's going to affect them. So right now, we can't say it's a third pole in the same way the Arctic is. All right. Now, what does this hold for the future? Uh, a group of us got together about five years ago and said, we need a better way to project the future than the one we have, one that works fast. Because negotiators who are going to arrive here from 193 nations, they're going to they're going to make deals, and they want to know, what does this deal do to the temperature? Can we run a model? These real complicated models cost a lot of money because they give you a lot of geographical detail. But if you're a negotiator, you're probably interested in what's happening globally. So we built the global model. And <clears throat> here's what it tells us, that if you take all the proposals that are on the table, by the 193 nations that put their projections of their reductions into the Copenhagen Accord document, which they're not required to do. And some of them don't do much, so you figure they're not going to do anything. But if you take that, an 80% reduction emissions in the United States by 2050, same for Europe and a lot of other aggressive places among the, G, the, G, the, the, the G8, this is what you get. We're going to have a 4 and a half degree world with a band of uncertainty that takes us from 3 degrees to 7 degrees. And then, I told you I worked with reindeer herders. This is, I was up 
in there just two weeks ago, and I got this slide from one of the students who is a reindeer herder, a woman, and this word guave means we have the worst possible winter that we have. We lose anywhere from 40 to 60% of our herd. And most of that was driven by a, a natural process forever. Look what's happening in the last decade. They're having guava years every other year. So they're having to figure out how are we going to accommodate this. And we're now giving them some tools to project it. And so they are managing their herds in a very different way. And if you're interested, let me know. I'll tell you how they're doing it. So one, one reindeer herder got up and said, that's our, that's our hockey stick. You've all heard about the hockey stick. That's kind of their hockey stick. Well, here's that projection again um, for, the, for this 100-year period. All of those publicly projected actions by government will only save us a half a degree, not too swift. By the way, this, is, this number has only changed a couple tenths of a degree since Copenhagen, and it's gotten worse, not better. We actually got it down to 3.8 about a week into Copenhagen, and it screamed back up as it became clear they were not going to be able to get a deal. All right, now I want to show you what that means. That's what 2050 will look like if, that, if we don't act, if we don't act. And those actions are just what people said they were willing to do, which isn't very much. The Arctic is going to be that. The rest of the planet is cooked. Uh, Arctic's going to be in excess of 11 degrees. The rest of the planet you can find is anywhere in the 5, 6, 7, 8 degree change. So those are numbers we just cannot live with in a way that keeps the planet somewhere near that sweet spot that we've become accustomed to. So then my doubters, of which there are many, say, well, it's the sun. And I just want to give you an example. Here's the sun. This goes back to just the last uh, 30 years or so, but we can take it back because we have very good data on the sun. So this is the sun doing its thing. It has this, what we call, solar max every 11 years. That's what takes it up. Uh, it's not changed hardly at all, and yet the surface temperature of the planet is gone. We can find no basic mechanism that connect even minor changes into that. However, some of these wiggles will contribute a few percent to uh, global warming as we know it. This has been repeated many, many times. So if, <coughs> if people ask the question, the literature is rich on this, and uh, it's, it's pretty. So the, the Earth is moving away from the sun, and that's the other reason. This is why we have an ice age, because the Earth goes around the sun, currently a fairly circular orbit, but every 100,000 years it becomes an elliptical orbit. And when it's way out, we're deep in an ice age. And here you can see, since 2,000 years ago, it's moved out <coughs> a, uh, a few hundred thousand miles. So it's clearly not the sun that's going to do global. Uh, climate change. So then I want to make a conclusion about some interactions that I think are essential to our understanding. First of all, the environment is where we get everything we are. If you were to look in this room and ask yourself, what in this room did not come from the environment, you can't find anything. The environment's where we get everything that builds the capacity to live the kind of lives we live and the kind of lives we would hope everybody on the planet has the capacity to live with. The flip side of that is the stewardship issue. How well are we managing that? How, how well are we working at it? That's climate change and bad weather, bad atmosphere, poor, poor water, and the like. There's that old 1950, the knee of the curve again. Energy, the same story. Energy is this engine that allows this house to be what it is, the cars to be on the road, the comfort that we all feel. But there is our economies. And these three, I would argue, are connected. I'll give you an example. If you ask the question, maybe I got it in the next slide. I can't remember. Yeah, I do. Let me do something. If, if you say your country wants about a three or three and a half percent rise in your, in your GDP, I got this number because I did it with a minister of trade and industry in Norway, and that's the number he gave. He said, I want Norway to have 
5%. I said, um, how long will it take for your economy to double? I don't know. He said, no idea. Lots and lots of years. I said, no, it's 20 years. He said, how could you do that calculation? There's a thing called the rule of 72. It's nothing more than taking an exponential mathematical function and playing with it mathematically. And all you got to do is divide 3.5 into 72, and you get 20, a little or more. It's the same way with the interest you have on your loan. Everything that is an exponential function can be treated that way. So if you have a 3.5% loan, you're going to, every 20 years, you'll spend, you'll double the amount of money you spend on, on interest. So more resources are going to be wanted. More energy is going to be wanted. Those are going to feed back to the economy. They're going to be feeding from the energy to the economy and to our economics. So I'd like to suggest that if we want to solve the climate problem, we better connect these and make them all work together, because then we'll have a good chance of doing it in the process. Or if we try to solve the financial problem without dealing with energy or the environment, we're not going to do it. Now, admittedly, that's a, a perspective that some of us have, but it's gaining traction. Uh, and if you want to play with it, go on the internet and just say, uh, <coughs> the interaction of the three E's or these three uh, economy, energy, and environment. So there we're back to the good old planet again, our home. And it's been my pleasure to be here with you and to share some of these thoughts and hopefully to raise some questions, both uh, I don't agree or could you expand. But I think we have a few minutes. Is that right, Bob? So there we are. So I'll let you moderate this. Okay. Sir. Uh, I really don't have uh, words to thank you for this uh, really fantastically interesting, informative, and important lecture. I, I'm really uh, uh, deeply grateful to well, you it's for, my pleasure, for the Robert. enormous effort that went into producing it. I want to tell you a few little the, stories. First yeah. of all, the reason I'm here is a very dear colleague and friend of his, Ed Miles, at the University of Washington, who said to Bob, tell Carell to come. So when Ed says, you got to go, I said, I'll be there. The second thing we talked about this evening, he has two sons, both of which are in, in Seattle area, one of whom has worked for the last 15 years with a man I worked with at Florida International University. And the world is small. <laughs> we better take care of it. And that's certainly a lesson uh, of this evening. Uh, it's time uh, for your questions, uh, so please, uh, uh, this. Uh, this talk has touched on so many issues, uh, it's, it's almost hard to imagine uh, how we could uh, reduce it to a single question. But please, do you have any? Please. Um, oh, sorry. Um, my question was, um, as the global temperatures increase over the uh, global A, um, the environment becomes more sustainable in harsher climates for plant life to thrive upon and biodiversity to thrive upon, wouldn't that sort of compensate for the negative aspects that you presented today? That's a very good question, and I should have dealt with it more carefully. <clears throat> there, as the temperatures rise, several things will happen, of course. Um, and the, I, the idea here is to present this picture, but to be in to, to do what he has thoughtfully suggested I do. First of all, uh, with uh, a little more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, plants will, for a while, accelerate their growth. In fact, greenhouses do this all the time. But they plateau after a while. In fact, the number of experiments on that front uh, are clear, that virtually every plant will have a rapid growth and a plateau, and so uh, you won't gain in the, long, in the long run. But there will be shifts in agriculture. The wheat belt will move into Canada and in the United States. It'll be productive as the Dickens. There'll be winners and losers in that process. Um, <clears throat> and the same thing will happen in Europe. The issue underpinning that, unfortunately, is just our water problem. And uh, while there may be compensatory adjustments, if we don't solve the water problem, we won't benefit from them. So there's that darn connectivity again. A really good question. And um, I don't get to give you the simple, I'm an optimist on our ability to respond to this. People say, how could Darth Vader, who talks like this, have an optimistic view? I am, I am convinced that humanity will 
will respond. It has done so for 10,000 years to very challenging moments in their history, in our history. Uh, and there's a lot of very exciting things going on to help us, help us do that. But thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Those are the kind of questions we need to clarify, because I'm sure everyone has heard something else that doesn't fit with this picture. And to the extent we could uh, talk about it, or if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. Yeah. Uh, please. At, at what point in the models does the uh, increase in the ocean acidification affect, you know, seriously affect the, the bottom of the, the food chain? Food chain? Uh, there was a big conference last summer to just answer that question. The answer is now. It's already happening. And it's demonstrable by literally these pictures you've seen are actually measurements that have been taken at sea. Um, how long that will then pour over into humanity's response, you know, fisheries and things of that nature, is clearly a few decades, maybe even 100 years, before it becomes the dominant play. The trouble is the recovery time is 10,000 years. Because someone in this audience will be there and a, and a geologist say, look, that guy's crazy. We've had 2,000 ppm on the planet. And the ocean survived, and the land base survived. How could it be a problem? And the problem is that the adjustment capacity of the ocean is on the order of 10 to 50,000 years. The bicarbonate we take for our tummy and that sort of thing, that's the time scale of recovery. So once it's there, it's going to take a long time to recover. And those numbers are, are very solid. Uh, and so once it gets there, so my argument is, whoops, my argument is let's not get there. Let's do something fast so we don't get there. Because if it isn't there, it can't be absorbed. It can't then affect the food chain. That's why I think we're going to have to do some pretty dramatic things. We were talking in a seminar today. If I could just take a moment to follow up on that, I was asked the question about, well, is the United Nations a framework to do this? And we're going to have 193 nations here, I don't know what the numbers are, but usually 30,000-ish people will appear from nowhere and they'll stay everywhere from Bahrain <laughs> and here to get here so they have enough hotel rooms and so on. The trouble is you're asking nations as diverse as Sudan and Ethiopia and you know highly developed nations and developing nations like China or the United States or Canada or Europe to all have the same, same game. And my hope is that they will get smart enough to say, the way to do this is build lots of small, bilateral, few nation, multilateral arrangements. So let's work with China, the United States. Let's work with China. And I told a story about an effort to do that today. We don't need to go into the deal. It didn't work. But our Secretary of State says, we want to make a deal with you and work climate change. And maybe if we work it and you work with EU and you know, China begins to work with some others. And over a few years, we'll suddenly realize we're already doing the things that we wanted to do with 193 nations, but we do it at a lower level. I think that's the way this is going to have to go. And I'm not an optimist. I've been to many of these meetings. And I'm going home tomorrow night, because I'm not going to stay, because I can just see what's going to happen. It's, it's, they're going to have a lot of conversation, but the, we're going to just nibble at the edges. And what we really need to do is make big changes in how we do our business. There's a gentleman in the back. Here. Thank you very much for a very interesting and entertaining talk. Uh, are we not going to run out of fossil fuels before we actually burn the planet? And then the science fiction movie is about going back to the Stone Age and uh, not really having electricity and things. Won't that, uh, in a way, compensate for the uh, disaster we are walking into? I, I, boy, I thank you for that question. As you probably know, the Minister of Petroleum or whatever his proper title in, in uh, Saudi Arabia said recently, uh, we, will, we will run out of oil way after we have to make the effort. It'll, the change will occur for other reasons. The problem is that coal, the reserves on the planet for coal, just in China, are at least 1,000 years. 
And that's just not the right time scale for this. On the other hand, peak petroleum, peak liquid petroleum, we're either at it or will be there within a decade. I mean, some people say we already went by it, others say, but it's near. And peak means that we're going to consume more or want more than we can produce from the wells. Whereas natural gas has taken a, 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 new, a new life. In fact, if you read the papers in the last couple of days, they're talking about the US becoming in energy independent within 25 years because it put a lot of energy into. And it's reducing its emissions. And the reason for it is for a given amount of energy, natural gas produces half as much CO2. So you really want to get out of coal, get out of oil, get into natural gas, and then swing into other forms of energy over time. And that could be an international agreed upon what I you know, call cascade. We have a chance to get there before we run out. You know, I told you when it was formed, you know, we'll call it 300 million years ago. How is it that we could be so arrogant to take all of it in a few hundred years? when we expect our species to be around for a long time, certainly far longer than that time scale. And some of that is really necessary for other purposes besides just putting it into heat. Pharmaceuticals are probably a good example. Very good question, and just the kind of question we need. Yes, sir? And there's someone's going to hand you a mic. She was with us in seminar today. Thanks very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, it was very well formed. Um, but the most interesting part is where I find that you, are say, you say that you are very optimistic. Yep. And uh, that brings me to a question that, because uh, it's like, like a box. If there are germs inside a box, and they are multiplying, as you said, you know, by, by exponentially. And uh, if they knew about something happening, much, I mean, before they, they see that they're multiplying, then they can find a solution. Mm -hmm. But now we have come to the end. It, it's really, for me, I mean, the, I, I don't see uh, a way out there. There's such a short time left that now, I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the germs are going to double in the next few years, and that's doomed. I mean, that, that box is finished. Now, but you are an optimistic. And uh, optimist, I'm just look, trying to find out because the solution lies with knowledge. Exactly. Well, yeah. Now, where is that knowledge? I mean, you can go to chemistry, you can go to physics, you can go to, I mean, I've seen this thing. I mean, the carbon sequestration is, is kind of, it's not even flying. I mean, you see, when we are in the worst condition, what we were even 10 years ago, when we, when we thought that this will be a, a very good solution. Right, exactly. So now, wh where do you want to go? I mean, do you want to go to the chemist, the physicist, the historians? The, the international relation experts, what is that, that body you think which will help us in this okay. of knowledge? Why am I optimistic, is basically asking. Um, and I thank you for that question, because I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that. Um, I do believe that there will be institutional activities, such as these uh, bilateral, multilaterals, will start to work the problem. I don't think it'll happen fast. There's too, there's too much momentum in the capital markets, for example, to allow changes to occur on the timescales we're talking about. But here's why I'm optimistic. The physics community has awakened to this issue. And I've been now in two different laboratories. And if you ask a physicist, what do you do, and you want to give it answer in one, in one sentence, he or she will say, I do physics that deals with energy transformations. That's what it's all about. And they will then tell you, as they have told me, uh, we've only seen about 10% of the available energy transformations that we know exist that we have not been able to harness the other 90. And it started with Newtonian physics, went to quantum mechanics, the string, string theory, and of course the whole nuclear stuff that's built us power, some power plants. But there's a whole array of others that are being explored. And some of them are really, really exciting. And I've been in the laboratory. I've seen the potential. They are very early. They're still laboratory stage. But there's stuff going on that would transform the whole energy world um, on a time scale of a 
couple decades, because that's the transformation time of a new technology. Uh, I don't see any of them being turned on tomorrow, but the two that I have seen, I, I, if they're anywhere close to what I think they are, we're going to see something uh, on the order of a generation moving into here. So that box you were talking about might get some constraints on it. Um, and in the process, we're still going to pursue wind and all the others, but none of those are, are big enough to take on the huge task that fossil fuels have given our lives, which is big spectacular. I mean, you, you have to all agree that we couldn't even be here tonight without all of that and all the history that made it possible. We couldn't even have the, the building because it took energy to build the building. Uh, but I'm optimistic for some of these things that are occurring in the physics community and that humanity will start saying, these numbers are now scary enough. We also talked about, do you know people who are that way? And the answer is, in my dealing with CEOs of big companies, they get it. They don't know how to make the transformation. They don't see the government framing, giving them enough stability to move huge amounts of capital into these other markets that would give, them, give us some transformations. And you know, I've been in, in meetings where that's what they say. We, if you gave us some stability, we could adjust to a carbon tax, we could adjust to cap and trade, we can adjust to any mechanism, but don't change it in two months or two years or five. We need, we need a huge amount of stability because we've had it. It allowed us to build our industries, oh, particularly since World War II. But you're right on the money. We ought to worry about that. This is serious stuff. Um, I'm going to do a, a thing tomorrow morning. There's a thing that Al Gore does every so often called 24-hour reality. And at 8 o'clock in every time zone, and I'm going to do the 8 o'clock in the, in the small island states. So it'll be 10 AM here when it's 8 o'clock at night there, uh, <clears throat> and talk about some of the things that, that you, you've just seen. But that process is not making, you know, Al's a good friend. I know him really well. We're not making any headway by just talking about it. We've got to get in and do stuff. And, um, and it's the young people who are being educated in this institution and all the others here in the Middle East and throughout the world that are I'm very excited about, about their energy. This seminar I was with this afternoon, the energy in that room among several of the students who are in this room is very high. So we should uh, do everything we can to give them all the tools we possibly can to do it. Uh, thank you, Bob, very, right. very much. I think we have run out of time. I think so. <laughs> I, I want to please join me in thanking him for it. Thank, thank you very much. much.